On some days your solar panels are generating way more energy than you can use. It's great then that in many countries you can sell all that excess energy back to the grid. But things are changing. Your national grid increasingly doesn't want your solar export. In this video I'll explain why that is and what you can do about it. Hi there, I'm Gary and welcome back to my channel Gary Does Solar. For those of you who have already invested in solar, being able to sell your excess solar generation back to the grid has long been an important factor in achieving a reasonable financial return. In the UK for example there are energy tariffs available today that pay up to 15 pence or more per kilowatt hour for electricity exported to the grid. And that's against a typical 24 pence per kilowatt hour for imported electricity about 60% of the import cost. And in some other countries it's historically been even better. For example in California the concept of net metering was introduced way back in 1996 with a government initiative called Net Energy Metering 1.0. This framework meant that any energy you exported back to the grid was valued the same as the energy you imported from the grid. And so if your solar installation could produce more energy over the year than you consumed, your electricity bill was essentially zero. Net energy metering was specifically introduced at that time to encourage the take up of home renewable technologies like solar panels. And the framework has worked very well over the years as you can see in this chart here from the California distributed generation statistics. You can see there has been an exponential growth of residential solar projects since its introduction. However, in 2016 a revised version of the framework was introduced, NEM 2.0, which weakened the benefits for those with residential home solar. There was now a connection fee payable and also a small non-bypassable fee for every kilowatt hour of electricity imported, even if that could be fully offset with solar export over the year. And it meant that electricity bills could no longer be reduced to zero as they could with NEM 1.0. The worst was to come though in April 2023 when NEM 3.0 was introduced. Instead of receiving credits close to the retail electricity rate, customers now receive much less, sometimes as much as 75% less. And this has had the effect of increasing the length of time required to pay back the cost of a solar installation, in many cases doubling it. The introduction of NEM 3.0 has also had a dramatic effect on the number of new solar installations in California. The chart here is the same data as before but zoomed in around the time the latest framework was introduced. You can see that the rate of new installations climbed rapidly in the weeks before NEM 3.0 went live as people rushed to secure their solar systems under the more favourable NEM 2.0 terms. Then, worryingly, after introduction the rate of new installations plummeted by 80%. It's not surprising that many solar installation companies have gone out of business as a direct result. So what's going on? Why is solar export in California no longer as financially rewarding as it once was? We can find the answer here by looking at the relationship between electricity demand and supply over a typical 24 hour day in California. Specifically we can look at net load which is demand minus utility scale wind and solar generation. In other words is the proportion of demand that must be met by other energy sources such as nuclear, hydroelectric and fossil fuels. This is what the net load curve looked like throughout the day in 2015. Generally flat throughout the day with an evening peak around 8pm. However in 2016 you can see a slight dip forming in the middle of the day. This is primarily due to the increase in utility solar capacity over the year. In 2017 that dip is larger, essentially reducing demand by about 5 gigawatts over an 8 hour period right in the middle of the day. And over the next few years as solar capacity continued to increase in the state you can see that dip in the middle of the day getting even larger. Now by the time we get to 2021 if you squint your eyes you can see it kind of looks like a duck. And that's why this chart is often referred to as a duck curve. In 2022 the midday dip is getting very close to zero and in 2023 it actually goes negative. Which means that renewable energy generation exceeds total electricity demand. Now managing the grid in such situations becomes more challenging 
But thankfully there are several actions the grid operators can take, including curtailment of renewable sources like wind and solar to reduce the overall supply. Such an action incurs significant costs though, as producers are effectively paid to stop generating electricity. Storing surplus supply in batteries or pumped hydro facilities, allowing it to be used later when demand increases. Transferring surface supply to neighbouring states using interconnectors. And implementing negative energy prices in some markets to encourage increased demand. So knowing all of this, it probably comes as no surprise then why the benefits of California's net energy metering framework have steadily declined over the years. With the rapid growth of residential solar in California, homeowners are now exporting significant amounts of electricity back to the grid precisely when it's least needed. So that was California, but the situation is repeated in other states in the US and other countries like Australia. But what about the UK where it's nowhere near as sunny as California? Is there any danger that the benefits of exporting energy back to the grid will reduce from where they are today? Well, let's look for signs of a duck curve in the demand charts. Here's a useful chart that I found that a company called Gridcog produced recently. It shows the changing demand over the course of a day for all four seasons from 2010 to 2023. The first thing that strikes you is that the overall demand has reduced significantly over that time, and there are reasons for that. But that aside, you can see a clear change in the shape of that demand as time goes on, with a duck curve slowly forming in the middle of the day. By the way, there's a great article on the GridCog site if you want to know more about duck curves in California, Australia and the UK. I've put a link in the description. We can see the effect of this duck curve in the UK by examining import and export rates of a popular smart tariff called Agile, offered by Octopus Energy. With this tariff, the import rate changes every 30 minutes throughout the day, and historically it would often look something like this. The rate would be slightly cheaper in the early morning, increasing slightly around breakfast time, and then peaking in the early evening. Notably for this particular tariff, a peak time premium is applied between 4pm and 7pm to encourage customers to avoid importing electricity during that period. The tariff also includes the option of two export rates. The first is a fixed rate, currently paying 15 pence per kilowatt hour, no matter what time of day the energy is exported. And the second is a variable rate, which typically mirrors the import rate profile. Again, a premium is applied during peak hours on that second option, but in this case it benefits the customer. If you want to know more about the Agile tariff, I made this video here which covers it in detail, and the link is in the description. It's just one of many tariffs that Octopus Energy offer, and if you live in the UK, I highly recommend you switch to them, as they are the most innovative provider I know. Switching is easy, just use my referral code here, and we'll both get £50. And as always, a big thank you to everyone who's already used my code to switch. Your support really helps keep this channel going. We can now observe the impact of the UK's duck curve on these agile tariff rates by looking at recent data from Energy Stats UK. The chart here shows seven days worth of data about a month ago. The green line shows the import rates and the orange line export rates. If we look at the 14th of August, we can see a dip in import rates in the middle of the day. And on the next day, that dip is more prominent. Then on the 18th, the dip is even more prominent and getting close to zero. And if we move ahead a few more days, we can see the dip is so large, rates are almost zero for both import and export. And looking at the data all through the summer, we can see this situation happening more and more. So what this tells me is that even though it's not as sunny in the UK as it is in places like California and Australia, a duck curve has been steadily forming over the last few years as grid scale solar and wind capacity increases in the country. And we're seeing the effect of that duck curve in the middle of the day every now and again, and we should expect this to happen more and more over the next few years. And this is making it difficult for energy providers to sustain the export rates they have today, like the fixed 15 pence per kilowatt hour for Agile. And that represents a real problem for anyone with solar panels today or who are thinking about getting them. In the middle of the day, when you're generating far more solar than you can use, you may not earn anything from exporting it back to the grid. Worse still, your energy provider might even charge you for accepting it, 
something that's already being considered in some countries, including Australia. So as more and more countries head to a situation where your solar export in the middle of the day is not welcome, what can you do to mitigate against that? Well, I see essentially two approaches open to you. The first is self-consumption, using as much of your solar energy as possible at the time it is generated. And the second is energy shifting, storing all that excess solar generation for use later. Let's start with self-consumption. Unless you're on a tariff that pays you the same for your exported energy as you pay for your imported energy, self-consuming your solar generation is always more beneficial. So how can you self-consume all that extra energy? One fairly obvious action you can take is to run all your heavy appliances during the peak solar generation hours. This includes appliances like your washing machine, dryer, dishwasher, or even your oven. And if you have air conditioning in your home, it's an ideal match for solar generation because you're using the energy from the sun to cool your home from the heat that's caused by the sun in the first place. Consider an electric vehicle. It's one of the most power hungry devices that you will own, making it an excellent way to soak up excess solar generation around midday. And if you're on an EV tariff like Intelligent Octopus from Octopus Energy, it can automatically charge your vehicle at that time. Just make sure your car is plugged in and ready. And if you're lucky enough to own a pool or a hot tub, they're ideal candidates for daytime energy use as well. Running the filtration system or heating the water both require a significant amount of electricity, making them perfect for absorbing all your extra solar generation. It's also a good time to talk about solar diverters for heating your water as well. Now I've made a couple of videos on the topic already, explaining how they work, but I concluded that if you're on a fairly good export tariff, the financial and even the environmental benefits are just not there. But if we look to where things are going, if you're not being paid for your export, or worse still, you're being charged for it, then a solar diverter becomes a great option to heat your water instead of, say, gas. But even better than a solar diverter is an air-to-water heat pump. These systems are highly efficient, and you can use your solar generation to heat your home on a sunny winter's day or to heat your water all year round. Here are a couple of other areas of electrification to think about. If you have a gas hob, you can consider switching that to an electric induction hob. Not only will this save you money by maximising your solar use, but it will also reduce your reliance on gas. And if you have gas heated towel radiators, you could convert these to electric ones. It's easy to do. And here's a video from Tim and Kat's Greenwalk channel to show you how it's done. Now, even with all these measures, you'll likely still find it challenging to use all your solar generation on any particularly sunny day. And this is where the second approach comes in, energy shifting. The idea is simple. You store any excess solar generation that you can't use immediately and you save it for a time when you can. And then you can either self-consume that stored energy, or if you're on a tariff that offers higher export rates later on in the day, you can export that back to the grid during those times. To do this, of course, you'll need a battery storage system. But here's the problem. If you already have a home battery, you've probably noticed that on a sunny day, it often charges to 100% by mid-morning. Now, whilst it's great to have a full battery for use later on, it doesn't help you much for those midday hours when your solar panels are producing at their peak and you can't use or export that energy. The answer, of course, is to dramatically increase your battery capacity. Fortunately, battery prices are coming down rapidly, so expanding your storage might be more affordable than you think. Here's a video I made recently that looked into that in detail. And if you live in places like California and Australia, where exporting back to the grid in the middle of the day is a non-starter, it's certainly worth looking today at the options and costs for expanding your battery storage. And if you live in the UK, you've maybe got another year, possibly two, before export rates start to become affected. And so that's another year or two for you to take advantage of falling battery prices before expanding your battery storage. And if you're still looking to get a solar and battery system, you may want to ensure that whatever battery system you choose, that it's extensible meaning that you can easily add on additional battery modules over time. There's one other great advantage for having a large battery system that we haven't spoken about yet, and that's using it as part of a virtual power plant, or VPP. Many battery manufacturers provide VPP capability with their products, 
and some energy providers are able to provide VPP capability with some of their smart tariffs. By signing over a percentage of your battery capacity to a virtual power plant, the benefits can actually be greater than managing that same battery capacity yourself. For example, you can get access to higher tariffs and incentives. VPPs often have negotiated contracts with energy providers, giving them access to higher feed-in tariffs and incentives that individuals can't secure, meaning your stored energy could fetch better rates through the VPP than on your own. Next is earning through grid services. VPPs are designed to provide grid services like frequency regulation, voltage support and peak shaving. By participating in a VPP, your battery can help stabilise the grid and you can earn additional revenue from these services, which you wouldn't be able to do managing the battery yourself. And finally, optimised energy trading. VPPs engage in energy trading with the grid, balancing demand and supply across a larger network. By pooling your battery with others, the VPP can take advantage of wholesale energy market prices, allowing you to benefit from selling opportunities that you couldn't easily access on your own. And of course, by signing up to a VPP, you no longer have to worry about managing the battery yourself. Everything is handled for you automatically. I hope that I've been able to demonstrate in this video that the financial benefits of exporting energy back to the grid are diminishing over time but there are many ways that you can mitigate against that. If you found it useful, please don't forget to like and subscribe as this all helps promote the channel. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.